Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be using principles of mass transfer in order to investigate water migration in buildings. So to start off, let's define the structure we're looking at. We're going to be investigating a building that has three parts to its wall. This first part is going to be composed of brick with a thin layer of paint. This second part is going to be insulation. And this third part is going to be drywall and interior paint. For this particular problem, we're going to be looking at an exterior temperature that is very cold. We'll say about negative 20 degrees Celsius and an interior temperature that's quite warm, 25 degrees Celsius. Now the temperature is important for these types of problems because it determines how much water the air can hold. And in fact, we usually treat water vapor in terms of relative humidity. So the relative humidity outside is going to be 80% and the relative humidity inside is going to be 40%. So with the temperatures, we can go look up the saturation pressure of water, which means how much water can actually be present in the air before it needs to condense. So the saturation pressure at negative 20 degrees is 104 pascals. At 25 degrees, it's 3,169 pascals. Now we can use the relative humidity to see how much water vapor the air is actually holding. In the exterior, the air is holding 83 pascals of water vapor, whereas in the interior, we're holding 1268 pascals. So our question here is threefold. First, how much water is actually going through our wall? Second, is there condensation inside the wall? And then finally, if there is condensation, how much? Now to start answering this question, we actually need to know the temperatures at each point in our wall. So we're gonna start by solving just our thermal conduction problem. We know that the heat flow is gonna be equal to our delta T divided by the thermal resistance of our wall. Everything we're doing here is per unit area, and so we're not gonna worry about any area in our problem. Now, in order to actually investigate this, we need to have the resistive analogy for the problem that we're looking at. We have three sections of our wall, and so we'll have three resistors referring to each of those. So this first part is going to be our brick, the middle is our insulation, and then finally we'll have our drywall. But of course, that's not enough for the thermal problem. We also need to think of the convection coefficients of the air connected to the brick and the air connected to the drywall. So we're also gonna have an additional two resistors on either side of these three. And these will just be our internal and external convection coefficients. Finally, we're gonna give some values to these, which may or may not be realistic, but they're good enough for what we're doing. And for our resistors, these values are all gonna be in Kelvin per watt. So plugging numbers in, our delta T here, is simply the difference between our internal and external temperatures. So that's gonna be 45 Kelvin, and that's gonna be divided by the sum of all these resistors. And if we add all these up, we get 3.6 Kelvins per watt, which leaves us with a Q dot of 12.5 watts. We're gonna use this later, but for now, let's go ahead and look at the problem on the water vapor side. So the water vapor is only going to have the three solid components. So all we need to worry about here is the vapor resistance in the brick, the insulation, and the drywall. We don't have to worry about convective vapor resistance. And the vapor resistances we have here, we're gonna have values of 0 0.04, 0 0.001, and 0 0.02. And these are gonna be in units of Pascal's second per nanogram. And our equation for 
mass transfer is just going to be m dot is equal to a change in our vapor pressure divided by our vapor resistance. Again, we just look at the difference in the vapor pressures between the interior and exterior, and we come up with a value of 1,185 pascals. That's going to be divided by the sum of our resistances here, which is 0 0.061, and this is pascal seconds per nanograms. Doing that division, we end up with 19.4 micrograms per second. Now, this is the value assuming that there's no condensation inside our wall. In order to check if there's condensation, we're going to use this value and go back and calculate what our vapor pressures should be at each of these points. We can compare that to the saturation pressure and see if our vapor pressure ever exceeds our saturation pressure. If it does, then there's condensation somewhere in the wall. So the place we're going to look is either side of the insulation. The reason we're looking there is we're dropping our temperature a lot in this region because it has the highest thermal resistance of any of our components. So if our temperature is dropping a lot, that means that our saturation pressure is also going to be dropping. But if we look at our vapor resistance, the vapor resistance of our insulation is very small which means that our vapor pressure is going to be very similar across that entire region. So it's very likely that our vapor pressure will stay at the same point while our saturation pressure drops below where our vapor pressure is. Whenever that happens, we get condensation. The place to look is going to be the cold side of the insulation because that's where the saturation pressure is lowest. Now, whenever we're looking at different temperatures and pressures here, it helps to have uh, just a reference. So I'm going to call, I'm going to give each of these nodes numbers so we know exactly what we're talking about and we can label these things easier. So the temperature we're looking at is going to be T2, which is the cold side of the insulation. To get there, we're going to start at our outside temperature, which is negative 20 degrees Celsius, and then use our Q dot multiplied by all the resistances that we're passing through in order to get to our new temperature. We know our Q dot is this 12.5 watts. Plugging everything in, we end up with a negative 13.75 degrees Celsius. Now we can use this value to go look up our saturation pressure. And we get that our saturation pressure at this point two is going to be 187 pascals. This isn't enough by itself. We also need to calculate our vapor pressure to see if our vapor pressure is higher than this. So our vapor pressure at this same point two is going to be the 83 pascals on the cold side, plus our M dot multiplied by all the resistances to get to point two, which is simply 0 0.04. This is Pascal seconds per nanogram. So taking our 19.4 micrograms per second, multiplying by this and adding to our 83, we end up with 860 pascals. Our vapor pressure at this point two is gonna be greater than our saturation pressure. What this means is that we have condensation. Now, if we were to do this on the hot side of the insulation, we would find that our vapor pressure is only marginally larger, about 880 pascals, but our saturation pressure because the temperature increases so much, goes up to over 2,500 pascals. And so we end up with a much higher saturation pressure than we have our vapor pressure. And so there would not be condensation on the hot side, but we do have condensation on the cold side. So we know there's condensation. We need to figure out how much condensation we end up with. So in order to do that, we need to redraw our model, but this time accounting for that new mass transfer. So in this case, we actually know the vapor pressure at three points, at one, two, and four. So the vapor pressure at point one is going to be 83 pascal. At point two, it's 187 pascal. And at point four, it's 1268 pascal. And mass is going to flow from the interior through our insulation to the cold side. And then from our cold side out to the exterior. But then we're also going to have mass transfer due to condensation. 
that's coming out at our cold insulation point. So we can calculate these M dots just by using the delta PVs. So for the external, we're going to have 187 minus 83. That's going to be divided by the vapor resistance between those two points, which is 0 0.04. And we end up with an M dot of 2.6 micrograms per second. On the interior, we'll do the exact same thing, but this time we end up with 1268 pascals minus the 187 pascals, this time divided by 0 0.021 pascal second per nanogram. And we end up with 51.5 micrograms per second. Now the amount of water that's being condensed is just gonna be the difference between these two. And so that value is 48.9 micrograms per second. But that's a very obnoxious unit to use. So instead, we can put this in terms of a day and we get that there's 4.22 grams per day of condensation inside our insulation. So 2.6 micrograms is able to travel through our entire wall. However, there's still going to be condensation and that condensation is gonna occur at the cold side of our insulation. Moreover, the amount that's being condensed is 4.22 grams per day. So there's two parts to this problem. The first of which is the thermal heat transfer side. And then we have the water vapor mass transfer. We need to account for both of those, thinking about the saturation pressure at each point along the way. We run into trouble most often whenever we have a huge disparity in the two resistances. So for our insulation, we have a very high resistance to heat transfer, but we have a very low resistance to vapor transfer. That results in our vapor pressure staying about the same, but our temperature varying drastically. In the end, that means that our vapor pressure ends up rising above the saturation pressure at some point in the insulation, which means that we have condensation. Once we have condensation, all we need to do is account for all three pressures, where our maximum pressure anywhere is simply going to be the vapor pressure. And then any excess mass has to go into condensation. Water migration is a very complex and interesting problem, and I hope this helps you make sense of it.